Gas is high there too, isn't it? In West Virginia. Good morning, good morning, good to see y'all here. I love it when we have this many in church on Sunday morning. and <clears throat> It's a special day, the 4th of July, and I thank you all for coming this morning and just for praising God and uh, thinking of our country and the people that uh, defend it, the people that take care of it. And... Uh, so this morning we're going to start out standing and singing the Star Spangled Banner and our flag is there and <clears throat> we're just going to sing the first verse, that's all, that's what most of us are familiar with. Okay. Bye. 
can all turn to 699 now, 699, we're going to sing America the Beautiful. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Let's all of us now uh, stand and face the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance this morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. And standing for prayer. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we are glad to be here. And for each one that came, I pray you would meet the need that each one has. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified. Be with Pastor Sage and his wife while they're away. Let them come back refreshed. And Lord, we ask that everything that's done would honor and glorify you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Pastor wanted me to read a few announcements. We just have a few quick ones. This Wednesday night, our midweek service, be prayer time and Bible time. And this Wednesday, Brother John Moore will be preaching for us. There are three ways you can give your offering. If you haven't learned that now, uh, let me know. Let somebody know. You can do it online. You can text to give online. Or you can give back there in the box that's back in the back. I thought we had one up here too, didn't we? I, I know we got the one in the back. Just the one in the back. Okay, just the one in the back. 
Our 200th anniversary conference is coming up August the 29th to the 31st. We hope you'll plan to attend this event. There'll be a special meal for lunch, visiting preachers and officials, as well as history about our church. You don't want to miss that. And you have two important outreach events as well for the anniversary services. We'll be going canvassing together on Saturdays, August the 7th and the 21st at 1030 to invite people out and put invitations on neighbors' doors. There'll be no lunch or afternoon service today. So the pastor wants you to enjoy the holiday with your family. And we're glad you're with us, each one. Some of you I've been praying for, and I'm glad I got to see you again today. Uh, you don't realize when you're not here that you're missed, and people do love you and do pray for you. Pastor prays for you. I'm one of those that have a list. We pray for you. Good to see John and Aubrey. I hope you don't get embarrassed by this, but I've been praying for you guys. Glad to have you here. Are these your personal friends you brought? Oh, your sister. Okay. Oh, hey, you guys. I hope you feel welcome here. Uh, it's a friendly church, and on behalf of the pastor, we invite you to come back. Thank you for coming, each and every one of you. And uh, Brother uh, Craig uh, is going to take care of the scripture reading. He's going to read that, and then he's going to take care of the songs. Then I'll get up and bring a message when he's done. Thank you. Let's all uh, turn to page first for 701. Let's sing our next song. And the uh, children then can be let go during this sun to their class. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He had loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred captain camps. They have trampled him an elder in the evening dews and dim. I can read his righteous sentence of the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. He is sounding forth the trumpet that shall never sound retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my faith, for God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. With the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. For God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Amen. I'm going to read uh, <coughs> this morning scripture reading is Matthew 8, 5 through 13. If you want to read along, Matthew 8, starting at verse 5. <clears throat> and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, 
and saying, Lord, my servant leeth at home sick, he lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. And when Jesus heard of it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> and uh, why don't we all stand and uh, sing uh, 698. the sweet land of liberty of the I see when of my father's died land of a pilgrim's pride from every mountainside let freedom ring my native country the land of the noble free thy name I I love thy rocks and rills, thy woods and temple hills. My heart with rapture thrills like that above. Let music swell the breeze and ring from all the trees, sweet freedom song. Let mortal tongues awake, let all that let rocks their silence break, the sound prolong. Our fathers, God, to the author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. God our King. Amen. You all can be seated. The pastor's got a couple videos, uh, well, video, one video and uh, a slide, I think, that uh, is to follow the video. And so, uh, Paul, if you want to start that now, you can, please. Good morning, Mainville Baptist Church. Uh, happy Fourth of July and uh, greetings from Alaska. Um, I'm at the Elmendorf Richardson Joint Air Force Army Base. Uh, we're staying with some friends of ours, Stephanie and I, uh, the Flores family, who are members of our church in Puerto Rico. And we've been having a good time. Thanks for letting us get away for a little while and spending some time uh, up here getting to see uh, some sights and uh, wonderful things. It's uh, 11.30 at night here in Alaska, but the sun's still out and it's still fairly bright, and I'm getting ready to go to bed here very, very soon. I just want to say happy 4th of July to you all and let you know that as I preached on Wednesday night, we're, we're with you in spirit. Uh, we'll be in church here on Sunday morning as well, and uh, just like you're worshiping the Lord there, we'll be doing the same here and thanking God for the freedoms that we have as Americans. Uh, that were born uh, on the backs of, uh, uh, of patriots who sacrificed so much for us uh, many years ago for our nation. And so 
Uh, I'm reminded of a fellow, his name was uh, John Stark. He was a 46-year-old uh, farmer, and he was also worked in a sawmill. And uh, right after he heard of the shots being fired there at Lexington and Concord, he took recruited 400 men and took them uh, down to fight the British. He was in the Battle of uh, uh, Bunker Hill. He was greatly used, a hero at the battle, helped fight the British off. They lost the battle, but he uh, inflicted severe damage on the uh, British at that time. It was later he was called the, uh, the hero of the Battle of Bennington. He helped stop the uh, uh, the British coming down from uh, Canada as they attacked America from down there. But the greatest thing about John Stark was he was known for uh, a, a quote, as a matter of fact, this New Hampshire's uh, state quote motto, as a matter of fact, and it, and it says, live free or die. You might have heard of that, maybe not, or some form of that. It's interesting to me, though, that uh, one other addendum to that, he said, death is not the greatest of evils. And, you know, that's true still today. Uh, we live in a free country. We're all blessed people today. Uh, uh, I tell you, uh, there's some worse things in life than death and that is losing our freedom. And I'm so thankful so long ago, uh, so many lives were sacrificed and given that we might have this freedom. Let's you and I stand for freedom today. Let's be thankful to God for what he's given to us and, and, and praise him every day. That we Oh, to have that spirit of the patriots today, that spirit of freedom. You know, you and I live in a really good day today. Uh, we're, we live in a, such great freedom in America, even though everything isn't perfect. You and I need to stand for freedom as well and thank God for it every day, you know, and and, and not allowing anyone to uh, silence us, not concerning our faith, not uh, when it comes to politics, not when it comes to saying what's right and wrong. Someone needs to still, still stand for freedom, just like our patriots did so long ago. By God's grace, may you and I be able to declare, live free or die. And that also that other statement, um, Death is not the greatest of evils. Let's stand for God, stand for freedom, and thank God for we live in such a wonderful country, whether you're in Alaska or in Ohio. God bless you all. Have a great service. That was it. Again, thanks for coming today. On behalf of the pastor, he he will be back. He he needs, and every pastor needs, at least a week or two of vacation time. I was given uh, anywhere from two to four weeks a year, and I could go hold uh, mission conferences and revivals for uh, I think up to a month. Not at consecutively, but total. And uh, I found out it was good for the church for me to be away, and it was also good for me to be away. 
And that's the way it is with uh, our pastor. He uh, wanted to get away, wanted to go up to uh, Alaska, prayed about where to go, and, uh, and I'm glad they got to do that. If you would like to turn back to Matthew chapter 8 again, I want to talk on this subject, the soldiers that are worthy. The soldiers that are worthy. And we know that many soldiers have given their life or sacrificed their limbs uh, so that we could be free. Notice with me, if you would, verse 8. Matthew 8, 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. And notice verse 10. Jesus, when he heard it, marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith no, not in Israel. In verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. I like this chapter. He said of himself, verse 8, I'm not worthy that you should have come under my roof. So he is a man of authority, and he recognizes Jesus as authority that is supreme. His faith lacked a rich heritage of his Jewish counterparts, yet his faith penetrated far deeper into the nature of Jesus than any Jew of his time. This simple declaration of faith was based upon what he saw and what he heard about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus was the full embodiment of the highest ideal of a life to a man like himself who was under a higher authority. Now there was rumors floating about Jerusalem that Jesus was either a false prophet or he had power to perform miracles because he was one of Satan's chief adversaries or, or, or counterparts, one of Satan's chief men, or that he was who he said he was, the Son of God. And these things were still being uh, talked about. There was the testimony of God that they did not know. God said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That was the testimony of God about Jesus. The testimony of demons was, he was a holy one, he was the anointed one, he was the Messiah, and did he come to judge them before their time? That's what the demons said. His followers, Peter, James, and John, said, in him are the very qualities of God. He is the Messiah. I find no difference in him and in God, found in Matthew chapter 16. And so the centurion was of the opinion that Jesus Christ was the supreme Son of God. He was the Messiah. The thing he noticed was Jesus was approachable. Even though he was God, Jesus was approachable. The principle of authority for soldiers usually meant there was someone higher in authority whose authority must be submitted to. But in Jesus, this soldier recognized his authority as identicals with God. So he said, I'm not worthy for such a one as you to enter my house. The others had said he was worthy because he had sacrificed and built them a synagogue. So they said, he's worthy because of what he did. Even in that day, there was a belief that you could work your way to heaven. And that's still what men think today. I was talking to someone just the other day for quite a while. Uh, me and uh, Nathan, uh, is that Nathan or Nathaniel? Nathaniel. We were talking to a guy, he had a motorcycle, a three-wheel motorcycle, 
you know, I was spending some time talking to him about, I used to ride dirt bikes and, and I like fast cars and, and I just talked to him in generalities about that. He was in love with that motorcycle. And so after a while, I asked him, I said, you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? He said, well, I, I'm a good man. I, I do, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything wrong. I, I don't do anything wrong to my neighbors. I'm a, I'm a good person. I said, that may be so, but the Bible says that there's none righteous. No, not one, for we've all sinned. That means every one of us, we're in the same boat. We've all sinned, and we've come short of the glory of God. That means... We've come short of God's expectation. And I said, uh, if you would recognize yourself before God, humble yourself before Him, and repent of your sin, and trust Christ, He'll save you. He said, you mean uh, I, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to be punished because I'm good? I said, no. You're not punished because you're good. You're punished because you're a sinner. Wages of sin is death. We deserve that if we reject Jesus Christ. He says, no, I just don't understand that. I just can't understand that. I said, uh, well, I'm going to tell you, you think about this. Jesus came here to earth to die on a cross to save us from our sin and to save us from hell. He will forgive you of all your sin if you'll accept him. And if you don't accept him, I believe anybody that turns him down deserves to go to hell. And that's where you will go because the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. He just looked really confused. I said, uh, would you read this track? Read it a few times. I said, uh, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to put you on a prayer list. And I've been praying for him. His name's Larry. I'll tell you his last name, but his name is Larry. And I pray that he comes to the realization that he's a sinner and he needs Christ. But this centurion, a centurion was usually in charge of about a hundred men. He's a man that recognizes authority. He is a man of authority, but he recognizes that Jesus' authority is unlimited. He says, I will be held accountable for the actions of myself to those that are above me but he said I know your power is unlimited you don't answer to anybody you are the final authority Jesus was accessible that means he was reachable he was available even though he was busy when this soldier declared himself to be under the authority of his nation under the authority of the Roman government he recognized that his authority was unlimited. I'm a man under authority. That requires total submission of those under me. I have people above me. But if I say to my servant, go, he goes. If I say to a soldier, come, he comes. If I say to anybody under me, do this or do that, they do it. But he said, your authority... It's unlimited. My authority is very limited. Uh, I preached as an evangelist when I was in Bible college. And when I didn't preach, I didn't have a church to preach in. I preached in the uh, county jails, Pontiac County Jail. Had, had several folks that came to know the Lord. About my, I think it was my sophomore year in college, uh, a friend of mine went around with a tent to various places in the south. And he said, uh, I'd like for you to come and uh, preach uh, about a week for me. Because he said, I want to get away with my wife. I haven't had any chance to get away. And he said, uh, if you would come, he said, uh, I'll help you call on people. And then he said, you'll take care of all the services, Wednesday night and Sunday. I said, okay. And so we went to this unincorporated town, Belva, West Virginia. Belva, unincorporated town, had about 25 people in it. But at the end of the week, we had set up a tent in a schoolyard. We started out with probably about 25, 30 people. At the end of the week, I was impressed. We had over 100, I think 111 
something like that. Several people had been saved. And so that pastor of that little church said, if I need to be away, uh, could I count on you to come and preach? I said, if I can work it out, if I have the funds and I can work it out, I'll come because the church was small. Well, eventually, that church called me my last year of school, and I went there and pastored that little church. They had about, when I went there, they probably had about 45, maybe 50 on Sunday morning. And after about um, six months, eight months at the longest, we had reached 100 running 100 regularly. Eventually, we reached 150, 175 on Sunday morning, about 150 Sunday night. Wednesday night, we had about 75, 85 faithful people. And while I was in school, before they had called me, this pastor asked me if I wanted to go and preach for a church that did not have a pastor. I said, sure, if I can work it out and I have the funds. I had enough money to fill my gas tank up one time. And I figured out that would get me there. And a love offering, if they would take up one, I would be able to get back. And uh, so we went there by faith, put the last dime I had in my gas tank. And I looked down at one point, because we still weren't at our destination. We had I estimated about 15 or 20 minutes more, and my car was on empty. When my gas tank was on empty, when that needle said E, it usually ran out. And, uh, and I had told the Lord, if you'll get me there, love offering will get me back, I'll go. That's all the money I had. And my wife looked over and she saw that E after a few minutes. She said, how long have we been on empty? I said, no, don't think about it. Pray that we get there. And so she did. We went to this place that I thought I was supposed to preach. Name of the church, I think, was similar. We pulled into the church, and I'm still on E. There's no gas stations. I didn't have any money anyway. So I couldn't have got any. And the Lord had stretched my gas to get me there. We sat down in the front row, and this man got up. And he said, uh, are you here to uh, preach? I said, I think so. He said, when, when I get done with the announcements, they don't know this. I was going to turn in my resignation next Sunday, but since you're here, I'm going to turn in my resignation now, and you can come up and be the pastor. I said, whoa, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I don't mean to open the can of worms. But I'm supposed to preach for a church that has no pastor. Oh, he goes, oh, I know where you're supposed to be. I know that church. It's about 20 minutes from here. I said, uh, 20 minutes? He said, yeah. He said, but there's a shortcut over the mountains, and it might get you there in 10 minutes. He asked his wife, he said, will you show him the shortcut to get him there? She said, yeah. All the time, I'm praying my gas tank is on E. And we got there, made it there, with a gas tank on E that usually runs out of gas. And uh, had a good service. And the people said, hey, we need a pastor. You're preparing to be a pastor. We don't care what that piece of paper says, or if you have a piece of paper that says you're ordained. We need a pastor, and if you'll accept, we'll vote you in. I said, no, I, I can't do that. I've got I've to get myself through school. God called me, and I want to get through school, and I'm not going to think about pastoring until I get out of school. I had some se several humorous situations. I often wondered how that guy was going to get out of the situation of telling the church he was going to resign that Sunday when he didn't intend to tell them till the next Sunday. But anyway, things like that happened. Jesus was accessible even though busy. He was reachable. He was available. And this soldier recognized that. 
Before you can reign in any position of leadership, you must learn how to submit. That's not easy for some to do. I've seen some Christians that have been able to do that very well. Others had a hard time with it. But every Christian has an area of his life that God meant for him to reign over. He wanted you to reign over the mastery of your flesh. And you are supreme in that challenge. He wants you to master your spiritual potential. He wants you to reach your spiritual potential. And how you do that is faithfulness to the Lord and daily Bible reading. I have sat down and for years, the first thing I do after I get out of the bathroom, the f next first thing I do is eat me a little bit of oatmeal, and then I sit down and read my Bible. And I'll read it until the Lord speaks to my heart. Sometimes I'll read uh, three chapters, sometimes I'll read eight chapters. But I'll read it usually till the Lord speaks to my heart. And always I tell the Lord, I enjoy what he gives me. Jesus was touchable, and he was also moved by people's infirmities. Notice here, verse 14, when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and, her, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. When the ev even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that might be fulfilled which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. The influence of Jesus was tremendous after this experience. And I find it amazing that there were still some people that had not yet believed. Every one of you today, you have a throne in which God will hold each of us accountable, a throne that we submit ourselves to obey. The flesh that is easily controlled by circumstances and sin are the flesh that has been conquered and is victorious because of giving God our allegiance. Your allegiance to Him is very important. I um, was in the Philippines eight years. I started church there. Uh, when I got to the Philippines, there was a missionary I knew that had been to our church, the church I started in Knoxville, Tennessee in 1975. And I told the Lord when it's able to be self-supporting, I'm leaving and going to the Philippines. And so I helped him when I first got there looking for a place that was big enough to meet. And I told the Lord when I had one over 100 people, I would start a church and I wouldn't start it until. I had not done that in Knoxville. I had started with just a few people that were saved, and uh, it's difficult. A crowd draws a crowd. And so I said, when I win 100 people, I don't care how long it takes me, it took me about three or four months, then I'll start. And so I started working with wealthy people, the wealthy people in Manila. And I found out that they wouldn't invite anybody else to the Bible studies I held in their home. They exclusively wanted me to just minister to them and their immediate family. Don't invite anybody else because we would not like to have them come. And so after a few months of that, a missionary who came there, told someone of someone told me that he wanted to minister to wealthy people, doctors, lawyers, movie stars, that kind of people. And they live in a wealthy part of, uh, of Manila. And so when he told me that, I said, tell him to come over. I'll give him the names of these folks that have been saved because I'm going to go north. I had gone south, couldn't find a building that I could afford. I said, when I find a building, you lead me all the way north, I would 
see a building and I would ask, what would you charge me to rent this building? And I'll probably need it for a few years. And uh, they would tell me, but it was way more than what I could afford. So kept going north of Manila until I reached Angeles City. Angeles City is where the Clark Air Base used to be. And uh, so I found a China, Chinese man that had a large warehouse and he said the Elks use it m most of the time but they don't meet on Sunday and they don't meet usually on Wednesday night. But if you want it, I'll, I will uh, lease it to you for this amount of money. I said, that's a little more than what I can afford. I said, here's what I can afford. And I told him what I could afford. He said, okay. He said, but you'll have to sweep out the building and clean it up. I can't afford to pay anybody to do it. If you'll do that, then you can have it. And so I started there in Dao, which was about probably in uh, kilometers, uh, probably about uh, 10 maybe kilometers away uh, from Clark Air Base. I had some servicemen one day saw our sign, Hillcrest Baptist Church. They said, that's got to be an American with a church with that name. And so they started coming. They liked the services. And after coming there three or four different weeks, they said, could we talk to you? I said, certainly. They said, this uh, place where you are, it's off limits. We could get in trouble if they knew we were coming here. We're not supposed to go this far from the base. But if you would get a building that's close to the base, we'll help you pay for it. I said, okay, I'll start looking. So I found a building right outside the main gate of the Clark Air Base. Used to be a restaurant. And I told the woman, I said, here's what uh, we'll be willing to pay you. Can you accept that? And she said, I need a little bit more. I forget now what it was. But uh, the serviceman said, uh, we'll help you. So I asked the lady, I said, can I partition off rooms for Sunday school? It was a big, big building. It was uh, even bigger than what this room is. And she said, sure. I said, now I'll make portable uh, walls that can be taken down, but uh, we need various places for people to meet. And she said, okay. Uh, that's where I started, right out to Clark Air Base. We had servicemen saved as well as Filipinos. But I remember thinking, when we bring our interest, we bring our passions, we bring our objectives into harmony with God's, we begin to reign supremely, and no cost is too big for God to meet. It is in our homes, our classes, our work, that it becomes a throne for God to be seen. This pulpit is a throne of God's power only when I remain in submission to Jesus Christ and I have confessed my sins and I have asked God to fill me with His Spirit. The measure to which any of us lead is a measure in which you and I are able to submit. I wonder how many of you today, you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you have submitted to His perfect will. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I know that there are some of us, probably, that have not fully surrendered to that. But that's one of the greatest thrills of our experience as a Christian is to present our lives a holy sacrifice. If we bow to God and submit ourselves to Him for worship and service, we have powerful influence that can be exerted anywhere we go. And I was in the Philippines where I started in the beginning where the wealthy people lived. I noticed a big beautiful mansion that uh, had lights on it when I passed there, because sometimes my Bible studies were at 9, 10 o'clock, sometimes midnight. 
And I noticed there was lights on, but I never did see a car in front of that place. And so I asked the neighbors, I said, whose house is this? Who lives in that beautiful mansion? They said, uh, the mayor, he lives there. I said, uh, I've knocked on the door, but I've never caught him at home. Mayor Aguilar, that's his name. I said, where's his office at? They told me where his office was. I said, I don't, I don't live too far from there. I said, I'm going to go see if I can set up an appointment uh, and have a Bible study with him. Now, probably 80% of the people that were members were one through Bible studies, through home Bible studies. And so I went to the office, and the secretary would say, he's busy, sir. He can't see anyone. I said, uh, he can't see somebody that came here 13,000 miles tell him the most important thing anybody could ever hear? She said, no, sir, I've been told not to let anybody in. Well, the next time I went there, I'd gone there two or three times. The next time I went there, there was cables and cameras. And, there, and they were, looked like, because they film a lot of movies in the Philippines, looked like they were getting ready to film a movie. And uh, I asked someone, I said, uh, are you filming a movie? They said, yes. They told me what the movie was, an old movie that they filmed years ago. This is years ago in the 70s. I said, uh, I wonder if I couldn't get in there. I've been praying to get in there to see Mayor Aguilar. And the secretary again said, sir, he can't see anybody. He told me not to let anybody in. It dawned on me that if I prayed, and I got in there and just fastly went and I opened that door, he would see me without her stopping me. And so after prayer, that's what I did. I went there and I just zoomed past her office and I opened the door and there's a lot of men in there. And I said, oh my. When I seen all these people in there, I was interrupting some kind of a conference. And I said, sir, uh, I'm sorry, if this is not a good time, I'll come back. I said, are you Mayor Aguilar? He had the big desk and conference table around him, people there. He said, yes, I am. He said, sir, what is this about? I said, uh, I'm a missionary. I've been here several times to see you, but the secretary always says you're busy. So today I didn't let her tell me that. I said, if this is bad timing, I'll come back. He said, no, sir. We were just about done. He told him, and he said, hey, we can finish this up. He said, I, I want to talk to this young man. He was probably in his 40s, I'm guessing. I was in my 20s. And so I said, Mayor Aguilar, I passed your house several times. I've knocked on the door, and no one comes. I said, uh, I've been here, I don't know how many times, and your secretary stopped me, but if you would let me take about 10 minutes of your time, I will tell you some of the most valuable things that you have ever heard or thought about. Okay, tell me that. I said, what are you filming? He told me the name of the movie, he said it's with Burt Reynolds, and he said, we'll probably start filming uh, this week sometime. I said, well, that'd be great. I said, do you realize, sir, that you are a sinner? Like the Bible says, that we are all sinners, including myself, and we all have come short of the glory of God. And could I explain to you how you could have your sins forgiven? He said, absolutely. And so I went through the plan of salvation, and I said to him, if you'll get down, sir, and ask Christ to forgive you of your sin, he will do that. And I showed him Romans 10, 9 and 10, 10, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I said, do you believe God raised Jesus from the dead? Yes, I do. Do you believe that if you call on the Lord like he promised, he would save you? Yes, I do. 
I said, would you do that then? I'll bow my head. I'll start off the prayer. And you finish it. You finish it by asking Jesus to save you. He did that. And when he was done, he grabbed my hand with both of his. He said, sir, I so thank you for coming here. And I thank you that you didn't get dissuaded from seeing me. This is more important than anything I've ever done. That is because I said, I'm a missionary commissioned of God to give out the gospel. And I said, now you realize you're a child of God. The soldiers that are worthy are those like this centurion who recognize they're unworthy. They're not worthy, none of us is, of God's consideration. None of us is worthy of God's great salvation. But God will save those that call upon him. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that is why I'm here today and why you're here. Would we like to have faith that gets noticed by God? I would. I would like to have the faith this centurion exemplified. Lord, my servant is sick. I'm not worthy you should come under my roof. But I know if you speak the word only, people can be healed. Devils can be exercised. And I know you can just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. That's the kind of power God has. I have seen the Lord do many miracles in the time I've been preaching. We had a lady call me when I was pastoring in Mansfield, Ohio. People's Baptist Church was the name of the church. And she called me on a Sunday afternoon. And some of you may have heard this story and some of you may not. She said, do you believe the Bible like it says in James chapter 5, is any sick among you? Let them pray. And uh, then let the elders of the church anoint them with oil. I said, I believe all the Bible, and I certainly do believe that. She said, my daughter has given just hours now to live. And I've called every pastor. You're the last one. And none of them agree that my daughter could be healed like James chapter 5 says. I said, I believe it. She said, would you go see her? They, they only gave her like uh, uh, 48 hours, but that was two or three days ago. Now she just has hours left, and uh, she'll die if God doesn't heal her. I said, I'll tell my church to pray tonight. I'll have my deacons with me, and we'll go and talk to her. I want to talk to her before I commit to anoint her with oil. Okay, when I got to the hospital, this girl had already turned blue. She had only been given just a few hours that day in which she would live. And I said, young lady, your mother called me. And I'm here for one reason. And that is to do what the Bible says if, first of all, you're saved. Second, have you prayed that God would heal you? Yes, I have. I said, do you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior? Well, I'm not sure about that. I said, well, that's the first thing. Let's get that settled. So we got that nailed down. And I said, one deacon only could come. The other one had something else to do. I said, we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to anoint her with oil. And we're going to pray that God raises her up. And she's a testimony and she lets people hear her testimony of how God healed her when she's on her deathbed. I didn't hear anything for a day or two. It's either a day or two later that she called all excited and she said, I'm living. I didn't die like they said. I noticed a big difference in my health since you prayed for me. I said, then you need to do what you said you would do. You need to come here and let other people know that you are giving God your life and you're living for him now. And I tell you, that girl was very excited about that. 
that she had been healed from a deathbed. And I know, I've shared this with some people over the years, and there are people that look at me like I'm crazy. Well, I'll tell you, if you really don't think I'm crazy, I'll tell you about a story that you'll probably feel I am crazy. I was preaching in uh, Canada. I had meetings from one end of Canada to the other. And uh, in one of the services, there was a lady in a wheelchair. And that lady, after I got done preaching, wanted to know if I would talk to her for a few minutes. And I said, well, l let me get the pastor. And I, and I said, pastor, she wants me to talk to her. Uh, do you want to be in, um, involved? I don't know. I don't have any clue what she wants. He said, no, I know the lady. I, I know what she's probably going to say to you. I said, okay. I said, then I'll talk to her. Other people came by. Don't happen often, but people came by and asked me to sign their Bible and thank me for the message. And I said, the lady will go back here. And her husband, he was there. And uh, I'll talk to you. I said, ma'am, they had a luncheon afterwards and I was hungry. And I wanted to get done as fast as I could, but I didn't want to not let her know that she was important. But I said, ma'am, can we make this uh, quick, what you want to see me about? She said, I'll tell you what I want to see you about. She said, uh, I, uh, I thought I knew the Lord. But she said, I went to a service, different denomination, and they asked me to kiss the cross, and I did that. And she said, they told me everything was all right. But after that, I had voices inside of me saying, kill yourself. Throw yourself out the window. Hit, slit your wrist. And she said, when I came here, this demon didn't want me to talk to you. And she said, uh, he's been wanting me to kill myself now for a couple of months. I said, man, I don't understand what's happening with you, except maybe you are demon-possessed. But I said, let's settle this. Let's settle your salvation first of all. And while she's there, her, her hand is doing this, one hand. And it's getting closer to my face all the time, this hand. I mean, seriously, this is how, how she's doing. And I said, ma'am, can't you control yourself? She said, I can't. There's times I can't. I said, then let's pray. I said, Lord, I know that you have the power to subdue kingdoms. You have the power to cast out devils. And I'm asking you to do that. And I'm asking you to save this woman if she's not saved. And I stopped. I said, now, I want you to pray. I want you to tell the Lord that you want to be saved and you want to serve him. Immediately, that arm, that arm settled down. And she asked the Lord to save her. And uh, I often think about the times that I have seen only a few times evidence of demon possession. But it's real. But Jesus has the power. He has the ability to cast out devils. Let's have a word of prayer together. Jesus Christ, He is touchable. He is accessible. He is approachable. And He's there today if you will accept Him as your Savior if you've never been saved. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to ask you a question. How many of you that are here today say, I am saved, I have trusted the Lord, I'm raising my hand as a testimony. There's no doubt I've ex received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Would you raise your hand up? Hands all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. And put it down. I, I didn't miss anybody. I didn't think anybody was missed, but possibly there could be. If you're not saved, would you ask the Lord to save you today and come and talk with me? Another thing. Have you been in the center of God's will since he saved you? If not, could I pray for you? You say, preacher, I don't know for sure if I'm in the center of God's will, but I want to be. Here's my hand. Just slip it up and take it down. I want to be. Thank you. Hands all over the room. Yes, I want to be in the center of his will. Thank you. I love him. Thank you. Hands all over the room. I want to serve him. I want to be in the center of his will. Preacher, pray for me. I saw several hands. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the message. Thank you for the privilege. 
of presenting your word. Now I pray you'd have your will and way in this service. Speak to hearts, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and we're going to...